Father God, I thank you, Lord, today. Lord, I see. Lord, I need your help today as we flow through this. And I just give you all the praise and the glory. Lord, this is going to be a fun message. And so, Lord, keep me on it. Keep me concise. And I'll just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Changing the rules. Doesn't it ever bother you when you're playing? I used to do this as kids. They'd be playing and all of a sudden you do something and then they change the rules in the middle of the play and so that they would win. You know? I was one of those kids that always played by the rules, believe it or not. Always did. As a kid, boy, there had to be had to be a set of rules. Of course, we lived by rules. We lived by a legalism of rules. It was a whole set of rules that we lived by. And uh, it, it was not a good thing. But we're going to change them today. Changing the rules. Okay, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven. What in the world is that? Well, that's the realm of rule under a king. That's the area that the king rules. It just still gets through me every time I say that sentence. Do we, do we obey his rule? The territory under his supreme rule. Do we submit to what he's saying? How do we expect to get the kingdom functioning if we aren't going to submit to the king? Just, I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a problem for me, okay? What is submitted and obedient to him? Are we willing to become obedient? Are we willing? Um, I heard somebody this, this week talking about the difference between being obedient and having obedience. Jury's still out on that one. But I understand what they're trying to say. It's not just saying, here's something you do, now do that. But it's the attitude of submission. The attitude of obedience. Where I'm just, it's, if push comes to shove at any given second, how am I going to respond? I want to respond in obedience. Amen. Okay? I want that to be a character quality. I want them to say, well, if nothing else, at least he was obedient. You know, I want that, that attitude to be, we are such an independent nation, and it is so hard. Uh, how many times have you said, or at least thought, don't tell me what to do? I'm, I'm, I'm standing in the right spot, am I? <laughs> okay. Why? Because we have this independence, like, oh, tell, you can't tell me. Yes, he can. And by the time you figure it out. Heaven is not out there. Every now and then you, you see something from the, the Hubble. The, these people sent around and say, look, it's the, the finger of God or it's the eye of God. And it's, it's all out there. It's, I'm sorry, folks. That's still physical. That's still this realm. They're not going to be taking pictures of it. Okay? And the less they, that's just all there is to it. Heaven is wherever he reigns. He is the kingdom of heaven. He's the king. It's wherever he reigns. Kind of fascinating. Uh, it's kind of difficult to determine. It's not very far away. Because Jesus said this. From that time Jesus began to preach in Matthew 4.17 it says, he began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The what? The kingdom of heaven. It wasn't near before but it is now. Now, you've got to understand something here. Was heaven close in the, New, in the Old Testament? Where is heaven? It has never been anywhere different. We were just created and placed within that realm. Heaven has always been there. It just wasn't available because we didn't have the Spirit. We weren't able to access it. So it was always there, but now Jesus says... The kingdom of heaven is very close. It's close enough to be squeezed. Squoze? What's the past tense of squeezed? I think it's squeezed. It's all good. It's close enough to squeeze. It's close enough to touch. It's close enough to actually know that you have it in hand. It's close enough to do something with. Jesus says, okay, all of a sudden things have changed. I'm bringing something. We're going to be talking about that really strong right now. We're going to change the way you think and the way you live. 
Now, we've been flowing through Matthew chapter 5, talking about how the kingdom functions in all these verses. So I want you to just kind of get your older blades on because we are heading for a, a really quick ride down the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might need a few pads and helmets and all that sort of stuff. Okay, because in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, it says this. Jesus said this right after he said, You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't put it under a grain measure. measure. You, you put it out on the lampstand for everybody in the house can get this light. And then he said, right after what we talked about last week, he said, do not think that I came to annul the law and the prophets. Verses 17 and 18. Do not think I came to annul the law and the prophets. Wow. I did not come to annul, but to fulfill. Now, that, that's, that's deep. He, didn't, he says, I did not come to get rid of the law. I'm not here to tell you that the law wasn't right. He wouldn't do that. Because we know the law is righteous and holy and good. If somebody could actually do it. If righteousness could come through the law, it would have. It just couldn't. So Jesus says, I have not come to get rid of the law. I've come to fulfill it. He says, until heaven and earth pass away, in no way shall one iota or one point pass away from the law until all comes to pass. If you know anything about Hebrew, they very seldom put the vowels points in there. It just looks, you just have to assume and know what it is. But if you look at written Hebrew the way it should be, a little T kind of thing underneath one of the letters means the next sound is going to be an ah sound. Ah. Uh, if you have a little dot underneath it, you have three dots, it's going to be an, an eh. Huh? See? Jim knows all this stuff. He's used to. In the, the one that looks like a W, if the dot is on one side, it's a sh sound. If the dot's on the other side, it's a sh sound. Just a little dot. These little dots are kind of moved around, little what are, that's the iotas. That's the pass, the little points. He says, one little dot is not going to pass. Not going to be gone. It will not pass away until all the law comes to pass. Now, these are finalized statements. He says, the law is not going to be, I'm not going to get rid of it until it's fulfilled. Until it all comes to pass. And this is all fascinating. Because they're all going... Huh? How in the world do you fulfill the law? It never says in there when one person does it all, it's all done. It doesn't say that. So they're all, you can tell they're all freaking. Right now they're all going, I say, what? So I'm not come to get rid of the law and, the, and all the Pharisees are going, yeah, see. He said, no, I've come to fulfill it. Excuse me? What was that? Yeah. It's not going to pass away until it comes to pass. What comes to pass? See, that? you can tell this is just mind-blowing on these poor guys. Fulfilled, come to pass. Completed, until it's done. And they're going, well, when is it? And he says, because there's no need for it to continue the way it was. The way it was is going to be completed, and now things are going to change. We're going to change the rules. We're going to change how we live. We're going to change the things by which we live by. Now all the scribes and Pharisees are freaking out right now because everything in their life was about getting everybody to live the rules. Okay? Jim was telling us yesterday one of the things about the law is that they respected old men. And if a guy came in with white hair, they're supposed to stand up. I was going to ask him, what happens if the guy's bald? <laughs> yeah, he... Start laughing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has been accomplished then. <laughs> I said, white head, this is still on my head, okay? So it's right there. It's good enough as long as I got the... Verse 19 says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments, the least, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the... Oh, how interesting. Listen, folks. 
I hear people all the time saying, oh, we don't want to do anything by rules. There's no rules and regulations. He said, no, no, wait a minute. See, without rules, you know what they call that? Anarchy. Chaos. We don't want to get into chaos theory. It's a whole different thing. <laughs> but what is it? Of course there's going to be rules. But he says, therefore, who relaxes one of these commandments the least, relaxes. Isn't that an interesting word? And it actually means in the Greek to let loose, to loosen. Now, he just came and said, okay, the law... It's not going to pass away until it comes to pass. It's all going to stick around until it is fulfilled. Okay. And he says, now, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches men to do so will be called least in the kingdom. He says, he says but whoever does and teaches them, this one will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, what he's trying to do here is he's trying to get us to understand what the commandments really are. He says, it's not about doing it on the outside. He says, now we're going to change things. Instead of you having to go to the tabernacle or the temple and do sacrifices and do everything, he says, all oh, that's going to be fulfilled. It's all going to be taken care of. He says, that means chaos, anarchy? Oh, no. Not by any stretch. Total, absolute system of beauty. So we're going to change the whole system. The law... And the kingdom. The law was there. But he says, now, we're going to change things and bring in instead. We're going to bring in the kingdom. The kingdom is not amoral. The kingdom is not amoral. It has morals to it. Okay? Uh, Jeremiah and I were discussing this yesterday. Talking about um, at work. They're talking about making them wear white ribbons or knots and stuff to, to show that they are in... Um, agreement with um, same-sex marriages at work. And so he was saying, no, I'm not going to wear that. And they say, oh, you hate them? No, I don't hate them. No. I know people who are of this persuasion. Do I hate them? No. Is it wrong? Well, absolutely. I don't hate alcoholics either, but I know that alcoholism is wrong. Follow? I don't hate murderers. But from what I gather, I hear, murder is wrong. Doesn't mean I hate them. See, I have a standard by which we stand. Okay? The kingdom is not amoral. It's not anarchy. Oh, let's get rid of all rules. No, that's not it at all. There are principles of living correctly. And they're principles. And this is what's, what's really beautiful, is it's changing how it's going to be happening. Now, all these things affect other people. That's exactly what we're talking about, is affecting others. And he who loses these things and teaches others. See, there's an effect that's happening. How you teach people to live. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to sit around and listen to kids talk. Okay, I was a youth pastor for 17 years. Kind of a fascinating deal. They'll sit and talk themselves into all sorts of stupidity. <laughs> And it is just amazing what they'll go for. Okay? And they'll peer pressure each other into doing stupid things. Why? Because they don't want the rules. Therefore, if can get everybody else to not do the rules, then they don't have to do the rules. Until mom shows up. And then... <laughs> oh, or dad. <laughs> wow, Jeff, is this like really emotional for you? It's all good. I'm okay, I'm okay. He's okay, fine. Thank you. Then verse 20... He says this, But I say to you, if your righteousness shall not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God, never. Now, you've got to understand what the scribes and Pharisees thought of this. And what everybody else thought of this, because they all thought the scribes and Pharisees who walked around in absolute, their entire breathing principles, everything they did was the law. All day, every day, about everything. And now Jesus is looking at these fishermen <laughs> from Galilee. And he's saying, by the way, if your righteousness does not exceed theirs, you'll never get into the kingdom. Now, this is kind of interesting because that means the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but you can't have it through religion. 
Oh, he's just saying, okay, it's very simple. You're going to have to find a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, right here, he lost a lot of the crowd. They're just saying, I have no idea. So just, can you imagine yourself in a legalistic place where there's rules and rules and rules and rules and rules and every little part of your life is down to a fine rule, fine rule, fine rule. And then he walks up and says, by the way, you're going to have to do better than that or else you're never going to get into the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. No wonder they crucified him. It's just like, how in the world are we ever going to do it then? So Jesus had him on the run right about here. The religion of Judaism is defunct. He canceled it right there. He says, okay, all that you do in, in the highest form of Judaism is not enough. Absolutely, if you did everything about the law, absolutely everything, it still wouldn't be enough. Wow. That's heavy. No longer in the doing, but in the being. He's going to change how everything works. No entrance into the spirit except one way. And that's to die. The only way you're going to is to die to self. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. It's the only way in. No permission to sin, by the way. On the contrary. Getting into the kingdom is not permission to sin. It's not relaxing the rules. Okay, It's going to change them. Watch this. Okay, we've done this. I would do this a little quick. In our body, we have three dimensions. Height, width, and depth. We also have time. But we do not have total use of time. We only have the time in a slice. In the present. Okay? Well, we also have a soul. And in our soul, there's height. There's width. There's depth. There's dimensionality in our understanding between the soul. And in the spirit, we know that there are dimensions of the spirit realm that do function. And time is different in the soul. Time is different in the spirit. Do we have ten dimensions or twelve dimensions here? Yes. Okay, we have no idea. Okay, there's... I'm, I'm actually thinking of twelve dimensions here. I think so too. Because I think the three dimensions of time are just like there's three dimensions in, in the height, width, and depth. Just like there's height, width, and depth of time. Okay. Um, that's the way I, my brain is now starting to play. <laughs> it's scary. It is a scary thing. Okay. Body, soul, and spirit, according to our other chart, how it works. Now, I was playing with this this week just because I had some time on my hands and I couldn't do anything else. And so I wrote out this whole chart. And then I took the spirit, soul, and body chart and I imposed it over it. I put the heart in, different things. I don't even know how to do this, okay? This is going to be, this is going to be really trippy, but uh, I don't know. Okay, we'll have to play with that one of these days. But we also know that there are senses. See, hear, taste, touch, smell in the physical. We also know that there's a see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in the soul that is different than the physical. We also know that there's a see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in the spirit realm, which is so much higher than what we've ever seen possible. Okay, that was quick. Thank you very much. We also know that there are negative realms, that things can get out of tune. The fact is, that's all we know, mostly, is the out of tune. We know that things are out of tune. In the negative, things are out of tune. We understand how things in the spiritual realm can be made out of tune. That's where demons live. That's where Satan rules. That's not rules, kind of rules. Still is a kingdom, by the way. Did you know that they called him his kingdom? If Satan's kingdom is divided, how can his kingdom stand? There is a kingdom, but he doesn't reign in hell. He doesn't have a throne down there. Jesus did not go to the throne of hell and take the keys of death and hell. Jesus has never lost the keys of death and hell. It just says he has them. And a lot of preacherisms has made that to where Satan had, or Satan had them. Where? Satan does not have any of that. For one, he is trying his hardest to stay out of hell. Hell is not a good thing for Satan because when hell shows up, it is made for him and his angels and is not a good thing. He is not reigning in hell. He is not reigning in Hades. Where is he? He's right here, folks. He's around. 
close enough to squeeze. Okay, we know that the body gets out of tune, gets out of phase. Anybody here ever been sick? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Roxanne is dealing with Caleb, who is out of tune. Way out of tune. Way out of tune. And that kid is having problems in every direction. <laughs> and mom and dad are out for their anniversary. So Nana has the critters. We're hoping Nana gets a little bit of sleep sometime. It has been a very interesting ride. But what is wrong is his body is out of tune. There's something out of whack. How do you bring that thing back into tune? Well, we've been talking about that. Now, here's the problem. I mean, I've got to bring this up to you. Now that we've got that, we've been understanding that. That's the spirit. Let's take that away for a second. A person who is un, who's not a, a believer, an unbelieving person, has, no, has a spirit, but that spirit is dead. It's a dead spirit. They are alive in their soul and in their body, but the tendency is to focus on the physical. Physical and some of the emotions and mind and things, but this is all slanted into the physical. It's about what is happening in this world right now. Our, their soul is combined, I mean, just pushing for the things of this world. Okay? There's nothing higher. He got them focusing in the wrong direction. They're actually worshiping themselves. So, what do we call that? Well, that is called the flesh. That's exactly what it is. When our soul is tied to the things of the physical, no wonder our physical thing is called flesh. But when our soul is tied into it, what's that called? Flesh. Okay, this whole thing is flesh. It's just, and it talks about the mind of the flesh is death. The things of the flesh are deadly. There's where the law of sin and death rules is in the flesh. So what, was, what did God do when they didn't have, from Adam on, from Adam till Jesus... They didn't have a live spirit. Their spirit was not back alive to God. What did God do? He had to do something to bring their flesh under control. You understand? So what did he give them? The law. And what was the law? The law was there to get your flesh under control. Okay? And there were rules. Thou shalt not. The whole thing about the Ten Commandments. It's all about the rules to get the flesh under control. Now, here's the cool part. When Jesus came and we got salvation through him, what happened is we all of a sudden had a spirit that was alive. We were born from above. We were born of spirit stuff and God's spirit came into us. <laughs> this is, okay, there's no way to chart that. Let's just believe it. Okay, I just, I just, I don't know how to, there it is. So what happened then? Well, then, because we have a spirit, we have communion with God, is no longer external, it's internal. I don't need the law anymore. I have a relationship with God that puts me on track. And what's that do? Brings the flesh under control. Anybody with me? You flowing? <laughs> In the spirit, when a baby is born, it's got a dead spirit? No. No. Okay. Nope. When a baby is born, it has a live spirit. When a baby is born and that baby dies, where does it go? Right to heaven. In Romans chapter 7, and we don't need to go here, okay? But in Romans chapter 7, it says, I was alive once apart from the law, but the law came, sin came alive, and I died. So it's when, sin comes when sin comes alive is when their spirit dies. All right. That was the quickest you'll ever hear that answer. All right. The law. What is the law? What well, was divine and holy? Wow. But it cannot be done by man. Even though Paul said, according to the law, blameless. Well, he couldn't find anybody that was more righteous than him to tell him when he had messed up. Had he messed up? Certainly. Where did he mess up? What? About thinking he was perfect. About thinking he was perfect, for one. But he messed up on the inside. Yes. Nobody could hold him accountable to that because nobody could get in on his inside to find out if he was righteous or not. His external was righteous. <laughs> external works cannot change the internal. That's a huge thing. The external works can't change the internal. Must be the other way around. Internal first. And then it changes the external. Okay? We've got to get these things in the right order. 
The Ten Commandments were the foundation. These things were real. They still are. God still says no adultery. God still says no murder. God still says no lying. That hasn't changed, has it? But how's it done? It's done differently now. Okay, Jesus changed everything. And let me show you how. Verses 21 through 22 in Matthew 5. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the ancients, Do not commit murder. This is one of the Ten Commandments. He says, You have heard it said of the ancients, Do not commit murder. That's a good plan. <laughs> murder is bad. Agree with me real quickly. I mean, Amen. Murder is bad, okay? At least bad. Okay. You've heard from the ancients, do not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the judgment. Hey, if somebody committed murder, what would they have to do? They were to be killed. Simple. Simple, straightforward, and easy. Eye for an eye, tooth for two. Boom. But Jesus said, but I say to you, now before we go on, here's what he's saying. He says, you've heard it said, and he's quoting God because God's the one that said it to the ancients. He says, now you have heard it said. That was godly. The law was righteous, holy, divine. It was perfect. He says, you've heard it said. He says, but I say to you. Now, all of a sudden, he is going to tell them something that is beyond what God said. Now he's going to change the rules. He's going to do something really wild here. Watch this. He says, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother without cause shall be liable to the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, or stupid, shall be liable to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, fool, shall be liable to be thrown into the fire of hell. Okay, now wait a minute. Has anybody here ever called anybody stupid? Anybody here ever gotten angry? <laughs> we'll just keep that up. Okay, we'll just hold this. Anybody here called anybody a fool? Anybody here ever drive down the highway? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Wait a minute. All of a sudden, he says, oh no, it's not just murdering somebody, it's getting angry at somebody. He has taken this thing and exponentially made it tougher. He says, no, I'm not going to do away with the law. I'm going to fulfill it. But I'm not going to get rid of your rules. I'm going to make them tougher. I'm going to exponentially heighten them. Now, right now, you can imagine what the disciples are thinking. Oh, my God. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. It's close. Anyway, I got the idea. Okay. <laughs> well, are you kidding? Now, what did Jesus do? He took the law higher. And here's why. Breaking the law required an action. But now, in the kingdom... It's what happens in your heart. You see, where they couldn't scope on somebody and see what was going on in their heart to see if they broke the law or not, now all of a sudden the Spirit of God is going to be in us and He is going to see every attitude, every thought, every intention. He's going to know everything about the heart. Now, this just went exponentially higher from an external to an internal. Jesus says, oh, I'm going to come. I'm going to fulfill the law. The law will be completely done. However, you've heard it said, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't even get angry. <laughs> okay. You can actually have to deal with your emotions. You actually have to deal with the stuff on the inside. Why are you angry? Oh, no. God doesn't really want to know why, does he? Yes. Of course, actually, he does know why. He wants you to know why, and he wants you to deal with it. Wow, what a deal. What you think is just as important as what you do. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? Huh? Huh? Okay. Are, we, are we understanding? And now it's more important. It's what's written on your heart. It's what's internal. It's what the Lord is telling you. It's obedience to Him as you have relationship to every second of the day. 
<laughs> yeah, he's going, I don't want to do this. Okay, living according to kingdom rules. But here's the beautiful thing. It's not about me having the strength to do this. It's about me having a relationship with the Lord. It's about just flowing in Him. There is no condemnation. But here's the deal. Do you want the kingdom? If you want the kingdom, you have to live according to kingdom principles. Now, what's it say later on? It says, it says for murderers cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You say, oh, what you're saying is anybody who's ever committed murder cannot be saved? I didn't say that. I'm saying as long as it is your identity of being a murderer, not a person who has murdered, but as long as you are a murderer, you will not allow the things of the kingdom to be functioning in your life. You will not inherit the beauty of the kingdom because your whole focus is who you are is wrong. Religion is absolutely, totally obsolete. Totally obsolete. And I know that I, I probably get some people really mad at me when I, say, when I said the, the thing, Judaism is defunct. No, all religion is defunct. It's all obsolete. It doesn't work anymore. You wonder how come we don't wear prayer shawls and, and do all this stuff around here and, and wear our, our kippahs and all this. Folks, it's not needed. Judaism is gone. Now we have something so much deeper than we ever had before in the external. Now we don't have circumcision of the body. We have the circumcision of the heart. It changes everything. 22, 21 and 22 says, You have heard that it was said to the ancients, Do not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, Whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be liable to the judgment. See what's different? See how he's changing it? And everyone who says to his brother, Raka will be liable to the Sanhedrin, but whoever says fool should be liable to be thrown into the fire of hell. Anger is not a right that you have. Actually, almost every bit of anger is because you have a right that you think you have that has been violated. Okay, some guy cuts you off in traffic. Why are you angry? You think you have the right to own this part of the road and to have nobody ever cut in front of you. Who gave you that right? Well, only your little godhood gave you that right. Why'd you get angry? It's coming against your godhood. You don't have the right. Anger is not a right. Anger is outside of the kingdom. Okay? Be angry and do not sin. If you can have righteous anger and not sin, you can be angry. Right. So that's right. Okay. When was the last time you got righteously angry? Okay. It's not, it's not the most common form of our anger, is it? Okay. The anger I'm talking about is the anger where you just got mad at the people who just said something to you. Okay. What's the true anger cause? To be angry at sin. To be angry at sin, but not angry at people. Big difference. Anger isn't a right. Anger is outside the kingdom. Okay. Then verse 23 through 24, it says, Then if you offer your gift on the altar, remember there that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Everyone, you, I, are you kidding? Now, you notice that this isn't saying when you come to offer your gift and you realize that somebody has sinned against you, go straighten them out before you offer your gift. <laughs> That's not what it says. Read it again, Greg, okay? <laughs> right here. But then if you offer your gift at the altar and remember there that your brother has something against you. Now, if we were to do this and say, okay, nobody can worship until we have fully reconciled with everybody in the room, Yeah, how much time do we have? And how much, when would we ever get to the point of worshiping? <laughs> okay. Folks, really, it is that, do you know of anybody who has anything against you? 
then go reconcile it. Okay? Then offer your gift. You have done something wrong. Deal with it. You can't worship with the judgments. Okay? Our inner man must be right. Our inner man must be right. Now, if you've done something right and offended somebody, you still go to them and say, we want relationship. Okay? But I can't repent for something I did that wasn't wrong. Now, you might have taken it wrong. Let's talk about it. Let's find out what it is. Usually I find that in my doing right and they got offended, that I did it wrong and maybe 5% of the whole situation was the wrong thing I did. So I had to go to them, not because of the 95%, but because of that 5% that I came across wrong. It wasn't what I said, is how I said it. Or I didn't, I wasn't nice to them that day, or it was something like that. It's still usually something. But if there's a break in the reconciliation, or a break in the relationship, there needs to be reconciliation. Okay? It really needs to be there. And you have to try it. Now, what happens if uh, you go to the, you've done And they wrong. don't, right. And they you don't accept it. it. Right. Okay. You're absolved. You, you've gone, you tried. What do you do? Pray for them, bless them, all these other things. But that's between them and the Lord now. One of the things we've been saying is when you ask somebody, will you please forgive me? It doesn't matter how they answer. Doesn't matter. I've done my thing. I've humbled myself and said, okay, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? If you say yes, I've gained my brother. If you've said no, I've absolved my part and now it's time to pray for you. Well, I teach, see, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Try living that one out. Uh, you'll offend everybody at some point or another. Okay, why? Because offendability is their problem. Okay. I try, I really try not to offend anybody, but I preach a different message than, hey, what can I say? It offends people. <laughs> it really does. Okay. Verse 25 and 26, it says, Be well attentioned towards your opponent quickly while you are in the way with him. This is right after that, where he says, if you have something, if your brother has something against you. Be well attentioned towards your opponent quickly while you are in the way with him, that the opponent not deliver you over to the judge, and the judge will deliver you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. <laughs> well, that went downhill quick. Truly, truly, I say to you, in no way shall you come out of there until you pay the last quadrantes. You know what the quadrantes is? That's the two mites that the widow paid. Here's the deal about this. It's kind of fascinating. Humbling yourself, doing what is truly right. If you're out in the way, which is you're out in life, do something. Do something about it quickly. If you've been wrong, if you've done something wrong, that thing will fester and it will come back on you. And you'll pay and you'll pay and you'll pay. Try your hardest to do something with them while you're with them in the way. Okay, while you're right there with them. Deal with things quickly. If you do something wrong, deal with it right then. Don't say, well, I'll wait two or three weeks. Two or three weeks is not going to work. Do it that day. Do it then, right then, as fast as you can. Because in man's system, you will lose. You can lose bad in man's system. If you don't believe me, just ask James. Who has to deal with man's system day in and day out and day in and day out. And how's he, li <laughs> how's he win? He doesn't. He, boy, it's really tough. And he has to just bide his time. And so even yesterday we were talking. And I says, James, you've been out now for what? Six months Every day you go to work with people who are outside of the kingdom. Every day you have to deal with all this stuff that's outside the kingdom. People pressuring you. People hating you. People seeing, thinking bad of you. It's all this sort of stuff. And he has to deal with all this stuff. Because people don't see him as a normal person. They see an ex-con. And I said, I don't see you as an ex-con. And I says, there are people who don't see you that way. But until he gets off his bracelet and gets his car running, he can't hang around with the people who love him. And so he's around all this junk all the time. He needs encouragement. Call him. Tell him how much you think of him. It's a good thing. What's he need? He needs that encouragement. Because he's always out there in man's system. And he realized it's not a good system. It's not a good system. But we have to work in the rules. And I says, man, you've been out for six months. Hang in there. It's now June. June 23rd, 25th, something around there. At the end of the month, his bracelet comes off. He is a free man. 
He only has to report to his parole officer once a month. He can drive. He can go places. He can do stuff. He can be up here in fellowship at that point. He may be even up here to start, learn, start playing bass and doing all sorts of stuff that he does know how to do. Really good stuff. The guy is really talented on many, many areas. What are we waiting? I told him from the beginning. Don't make any plans until the end of June. And I says, man, you only got two weeks to go. Don't blow it now. You know, just relax. It's all good. So I joke with him. And he gets to laughing, gets to feeling better. We get to think, and he, fine, thanks. Why? He just needs encouragement. He just needs somebody to call him up and say hi. It'd just be really cool if somebody were to stop by and take him for dinner somewhere. Be a real person to him. Yes, I'm just telling you, these are things, the ministries we have to him. The only problem is, he lives at 112th and, and I-25. Just in, in Washington, okay? It's out there somewhere. It takes a while to get there. He'd be here this morning if somebody gave him a ride. Of course, it takes you how long to get, you know? He'll probably listen to this and he'd call me up. Brother! Okay. I can imitate him really well, by the way. I just want to let you know. And it's, uh, he'll, yeah, he'll thump me. Okay. Verses 27 and 28 says, You have heard that it was said to the ancients, now Jesus is going after it again, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone looking at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. Exponentially higher. It's not just committing adultery, it's even thinking about committing adultery. It's even lusting after them. Exponentially higher. Well, here's the big deal exponentially worse for these these men in the room they're all going like you're kidding oh yeah yeah every thought can man be free of this yes. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would say yes after all the things we go dang straight we can okay why because we're living in the kingdom we're living in different rules only in the kingdom can a man be set free from this to the point where his brain is actually becoming righteous his thoughts are being changed. Can a man be set free from lust? Absolutely. But there's a lot of people who say they can't. A lot of Christian pastors say they can't. You know what that means? The Christian pastors aren't. We wouldn't be told if we couldn't do it. We wouldn't be told not to do it if we couldn't do it. Of course we can do it. Of course we can. Verses 29 and 30. But if your right hand, right eye offends you, take it out and throw it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and all your body be not thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to offend, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's profitable to you that one of your members should perish and all your body not be thrown into hell. Now, this is kind of a, this is one of those deals. I've heard people, you know, who have actually taken, taken a hatchet and cut off a hand. Okay? Not a good idea. All right. <laughs> See? <laughs> Amen. A little graphic there, but it's all good. Okay. <laughs> Chopping off. Plucked eyes. Folks, what's it talking about? It says, if your right eye is going to make it so that you cannot come to Jesus, then get rid of your eye. This isn't talking about just a sin that you have. Wait a minute. Is this going to keep you from coming to Jesus? Is it going to keep you from eternal salvation? Then you need to do something, okay? But here's what it really boils down to. It's not external. He's been talking all the time about internal. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Even though it's talking about remembers your body, be better. But here's what he's talking. Right eye and right hand. Notice it said right eye. If your right eye offends you, now your left eye can't offend you, right? Huh? huh? Yeah, that's one of those, wait a minute. And then he says, if your right hand causes, huh? What, your left hand can't sin, but your right hand can? See the little problems I have to deal with? Is it, well, why? So left handers are inherently righteous. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was questioning the statement. And I will continue to question the statement. Here's the deal. Right eye, right hand. What is it talking about? It's talking about what you focus on is your eye. 
your right eye. What you focus on, if what you worship is keeping you from the kingdom, then throw that away. Cut it off. Cut it out. It doesn't matter what it costs you. Get rid of it. If your worshiping of yourself is going to keep you from worshiping Jesus, you need to cut off that worshiping of yourself. Okay? That's the eye. The eye is the idea of what you worship. What's the hand? It's what you do. It's your strength. If what you do, what you do with your right hand, if that right-handed, not right-handedness, but that thing that you do with your predominant hand is going to just consume your life, is going to keep you from going to the things of God, then it's better for you to cut it off. Get rid of the things you worship. Get rid of the things you do that are going to keep you from the things that are most important. Cut them off. Get rid of them. He's, he's talking, but he's been talking internal this whole time. He's still, yeah, but it's going to do something. But even if it was, folks, what would happen? Would it be better to actually lose a hand and go into heaven? Yes. Oh, yeah, going to get a new body anyway. It's going to be, yeah, always pray for a restoration. Lord. No. <laughs> you know. Okay. Verses 31 through 32 says, It was also said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever, by the way, that's not in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, he's bringing up the whole law. The whole law. Whoever puts away his wife, let him give him a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever puts away his wife apart from the matter of fornication causes her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry the one put away commits adultery. Now, all of a sudden, we're in trouble. This is instant meddling. As soon as I bring up this, this passage, I'm in trouble with piles and piles and piles of people. I haven't even said anything yet, and I'm already in trouble. Okay? You bring up divorce and remarriage, we're in trouble. Okay? This is an emotional issue. It has very little to do with, with anything else. It's all a bunch of emotion. Am I condemning of people who have been divorced? No. Just like I'm not condemning of people who have committed murder. You say, so divorce and murder is the same thing? Well, my wife said, I will never divorce you, but murder is an option. <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, I don't know, in her eyes, maybe they're... Just, anyway, but the deal is this. Let's look at this passage, and I'm not going to get into debate. If anybody wants to debate me on this, suffer. I'm not going to get into a discussion on this. I'm going to do it very quickly and efficiently and move on. All right? That's the problem. Is the word fornication, and then the same word, verse, it uses the word adultery. Fornication is not adultery, but adultery is fornication. Okay, here's the deal. Here's what he was talking about. If a man comes to his wife, and this is all in Jewish times, where they would be married for a year before they consummated. it. They were legally married for a year. This is where Joseph and Mary were. They were legally married, but they called it betrothed. They didn't consummate the marriage for a year. Why? So that in that time, you could find out if she was pregnant or not. But in that time, if he finds out there's something about her that was wrong, he can divorce her, give her a bill of divorce and say, you're gone. He can be righteously do that. Joseph would have been righteous in doing that. Except God said, don't. <laughs> You know, that's kind of like takes care of the righteousness part right there. God said, don't. Okay. If they come together at the consummation and he finds out she's not a virgin, he can stop the marriage right then. That's it. That's the acceptance for the matter of fornication. That's what it's talking about. But if he stays with her the night, has sex with her and hangs around, he's married to her for the rest of his life. He is in covenant with her, and it doesn't matter if either of them become prostitutes. There is no cause for divorce after that night. Got it? That's all I'm doing. Okay? He says, but they used it, what? 
Man, they even had rabbis that said, if she burns your toast in the morning, you can give her a piece of paper. This is a writ of divorce. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And out the door she goes. No rights, no anything. Out on the street. Verses 33 through 37. Again, you have heard it was said to the ancients, you shall not swear falsely, but shall give your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Neither by heaven, because it is God's throne, nor by the earth, because it's the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, because it's the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you're not able to make one hair white or black. But let your word be yes, yes, and no, no, for the excess of these is from evil. This is not talking about cussing. It's not talking about cussing. It's talking about swearing about something. Saying, okay, I will come to your house and do some things for you. I swear by Jerusalem that I will come and do that. He says, don't swear by Jerusalem. It's the, it's the city of the king. What does it matter to you? Okay, I swear by this that I will do so. Okay, he says, all of that is evil. Just let your yes be yes. Will you come do this? Yes. Or no. That's all cool. It's not about cussing. Now, you got to understand that I was on the phone with somebody, I was to Randall this week, and Roxanne was listening, and I was telling him about what I was going to be presenting this morning, and I was talking about this verse, and it says, because says, we're not able to even make, it says right there, it says, because you are not able to make one hair white or black, and my wife says, that's not true, you've made all mine white. <laughs> there there's nothing I could say, you know, I'm... Yeah, I just like, oh, mercy. Well, and I looked in the mirror and I go, yeah, well, I don't know that that was, was that my choice? <laughs> anyway, we're going to let that one just ride the way it is, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but let your yes be yes to your no, no. He says, they said, you should swear by this. He says, I'm telling you, don't swear at all. Okay? It's not about cussing. It's about swearing about items. He talks about that later. Verses 38 through 42 and says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, here we go. We're in trouble. Do not resist the evil. It, well, huh? Do not resist the evil. For whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And to him desiring to sue you and to take your tunic, allow him to also have the coat. And whoever shall compel you to go one mile, go two with him. He asking you to give and he wishing to borrow from you, do not turn away. Now he is messing with everything they have about their whole thing. Do not resist the evil. Excuse me? Okay, now there's some, there's some things we need to really understand about this. Okay? Because there's some principles here. Attitude and trust is the whole issue that he's got going here. Do not resist the evil. Now, I don't have a carry permit for my gun. Fact is, I don't even know how to take my gun apart to clean it. I think I know, but it's got some... i got to take a pin and drive a pin out just to get the thing apart to even clean it. I don't know. It's just kind of unique. Everybody else has these guns that just go this and they fall apart and it's really cool and they clean all the parts and put it back together and it's all neat and not mine to drive a pin up. I don't even know about it okay I know enough about guns to be totally dangerous okay not necessarily to the bad guys but to everybody else around me could be really in trouble okay the deal is this I don't have a carry permit I don't carry a gun around waiting to see if somebody's going to do something dumb so I can resist their evil with a 9 millimeter. No, that's not the issue. Now, here's the deal. Defend your family in a normal evil. Okay, there are certain things. If a guy's breaking into our house, I will stop him from hurting, raping, whatever. I will stop him. However, if it's in the case of persecution, don't even resist. See, there's a difference between him robbing me to take my money and we stop him. Is it worth killing him over? Is it worth sending him to hell? No. Okay, I really have a hard time with that, killing somebody for, for something stupid. Now, you've got to understand that this world is temporary. What's he going to do? Take your stuff? Well, who gave that stuff to you in the first place? Okay, no, it's okay. But if they're going to hurt my, my wife, my daughters, I'm going to stop them from that. Unless it's about the cause of Christ things change right there. We told our kids 
And I know that you, get, you hear this from Miranda's point of view because she was pretty young when she heard this. It's like totally freaky. But I to, we told them when we went to Russia, if they have a gun to our heads and says, renounce Christ or we kill your parents, all I can say is goodbye. We'll see you in heaven. Do not renounce Christ. But if they have a gun to your head and tell us to renounce Christ or they'll kill you, all I can say to you is, we will see you in heaven. Bye. I will not renounce Christ. Now, that was a heavy-duty sta uh, statement. How old were you? I think seven. Yeah. Eight. Okay. We reiterated it to them every now and then. Okay? Because they needed to know. When it comes to the cause of Christ, we will not resist at all. You are provided for. They aren't. They want to steal something. Let them steal it. If somebody wants something of yours, within reason, there are people who play the system. I'm not going to let them play the system because I'm going to love them enough to have them not learn how to manipulate the system. Okay? I'm not stupid. I'm going to, you know, do th but if somebody really does need a coat, they can have a coat. I'll get one. It's not a problem. I have provision that they don't know about. If somebody needs... A now, the thing about if they ask you to go one mile, go with them two, a Roman soldier could come up to any given citizen and say, carry my pack one mile carry my goods and you had to carry all you could for one mile it was the law and Jesus says if they ask you to go one mile go two excuse me carry this soldier stuff this guy is the occupying force in this country and you want me to carry stuff two miles yeah because in that second mile he's going to see something different about you and you can bring the gospel to him there's ways of doing this it's an attitude they are ruled by what they own you're not. Well, hopefully you're not. That's the whole idea. Okay? Attitude in giving shows who you are. I gave last night to um, to uh, Gail Harris's thing. Put money in the in the in the offering. When Joanne McFadder came up and started. They, were, they did all these auctions and different stuff. And I thought, if I'm going to give money, I'm just going to give money. I'm not going to give money so I can get something. So I, I just, I just pfft, shined it on. And, uh, but when it came time for Joanne to be throwing out some of her tapes, it was not, or her CDs, it was not a big deal. Until she got to one, she says, that Step Into Me song is on this one. And I went, I like that song. And it's, it's really, and I said, and so I raised my hand for that one. I said, and I even said, please. I thought even politeness would completely change the field of play, you know, because everybody else was going, me, me, me. I was going, please, you know, it's all good. And so I said, please, and she just ignored me completely and gave it to somebody else. And I went, even, I was even polite. I looked at Rich, I said, I was even polite. He went out and got her CD and came down and put it on my Bible. I can't outgive him. He's going to give back. I'm going to give, I'm going to just, you understand the attitude? I was so blessed. And I played that this morning. And that, it's the first song on the album. i got to play this. So you're going to love this. And for those of you who know anything about identity, about the things we do with identity, this song is Step Into Me. Step Into Me. But she wrote it as asking Christ to step into her. And I'm saying, He's already in you. But you have the choice whether you are going to put on Christ or not. So you have the choice to step into Him. Okay. And I got all these things were going in my little brain. So I was going <laughs> to... My poor little brain. All right. Verses 43 through 45. And I got to wrap up here pretty quick. You have heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, it doesn't say hate your enemy in the Old Testament. Notice the quote, stop right at love your neighbor. But he understood the, the culture that they were taking from the law to hate your enemy. Because they hated anybody that was not a Jew. You got to understand. So he's saying... You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Freaked out their brains. Bless those that curse you. You're out of your mind. Do well to those hating you. Are you like jiving me? <laughs> and pray for those abusing and persecuting you. Why would I do that? So that you may become sons of your father in heaven. Because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. He says, what? What am I supposed to do? Oh, somebody abuses me. I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to pray for them. I'm supposed to give to them. I'm supposed to help them. You say, that is so contrary to culture. Yes, that's what we're trying to get at is contrary to man's culture. It is God's culture. 
to have them not have the ability to affect me, I will bless them anyway. I will pray for them anyway. I will love them anyway. Why? Because then it shows that I have the spirit of the kingdom applying into this realm. I'm a kingdom child. Love and laying down your soul. It's the key to the whole thing. Then verses 46 and 47 says, For if you love those loving you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors, the scum of the earth, do that? <laughs> but if you only greet your brothers, what exceptional thing do you do? Do not the tax collectors do so? Boy, and he's sitting there saying, Come on, you're not doing anything different than the tax collectors, the most hated of the hated. The IRS, right there, you know. Just... What is the proof of your citizenship in the kingdom? What is the proof? You're doing the same thing everybody else does. What's the difference? How does your light really shine? What, what's he saying here? And then verse 48 says, Therefore, you be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, the word perfect is, is not a good way of putting that. Okay? I just wanted, that's what it said in my, my translation. As soon as we look at that, because I can't be perfect. But notice it says, therefore you be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, as you listen to your Father in heaven, it will perfect you. Okay? As he is totally able to do it all, all you have to do is listen to him and obey. But the Greek word is a Greek word, teleos. Complete, mature, the end result. It says now even be complete. Be mature. Okay? Now this is kind of fascinating to me. It says now be like your Father. Just have relation with him and obey do whatever the father is doing and you will fulfill the law that's what's so fascinating totally baffling without the spirit it will not, not happen beyond anything they thought possible this is way beyond anything they thought possible so we're talking about being weird being weird we gotta be different than our culture we are weird man that's weird to love people that hate you yeah we cannot respond the way the world does. I typed that quickly, by the way. I didn't even think about it. So. <laughs> we cannot respond the way the world does. We are a different race. We are different. We are absolutely a different race. We must show them how the spirit responds, how spirit people respond to things. We've got to show them. It's the way it should be. We operate with different physics. Now, I know this is kind of interesting, but physics are about the physical realm. So what are they called in the soul realm? They should be called solix. And in the spirit realm, there should be spirit icks, don't you think? I don't think it'll catch on, but <laughs> that's the idea of understanding the properties of how things work. Okay, this world is not the final authority. Fact is, this world is a lowest authority. We have to show who we are by our actions. Now, do you realize I covered over 30 some verses? Yeah, amazing. Here we're going. But here's the deal. What is the real thing about all of this is who are you? Why are we living according to the culture of man when we should be living according to the culture of God? When we start talking about the kingdom, we need to understand that we are kingdom citizens and we are the ones that bring the kingdom here. Because the kingdom of God is within hand. So by whose rules do you want to play? You want to do religion? Anybody here want to do religion? I'm done with religion. No more. However, the rules for being kingdom people are exponentially higher, but they're done because of joy, not because of a rule. Why do I do it? I do it because it's right and it feels right. Okay. Are you religious? My God, I hope not. People say, Pastor, oh, well, I'm not religious. Oh, neither am I. And they go, huh? What? I uh, hate religion. What? Uh. Okay. Are you in the world or of the world? Well, I'm in it, but I'm not of it. Amen? Amen? So we're just getting to know the mysteries of the spirit kingdom. Living differently in this realm. Did you get something out of that this morning? Do you understand the rules by which you play? The rules by which you play is to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's better, higher, stronger, faster. You know, it's the bionic God or something. I don't know how to put it. It's not enough to just forgive the person that abuses you. You have to actually love them. You've got to take it at a higher level. All right. Well, are you blessed? Okay. Father God, I do thank you. 
Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I just give you praise. You are magnificent. And we love you so deeply. Lord, teach us to live and to walk in ways beyond what we've ever seen before. That we may see how the kingdom functions. And Lord, we just give you the praise for you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.